Going into the season, every MLB team wakes up from their four-month summer with one goal in mind, win the World Series. For two-thirds of these teams, they know their chances are slim. For the remaining 10, it's all or nothing. These teams know it'll be an uphill battle and hardly any World Series team has ever done it without making at least a few acquisitions to get them to the finish line. Over the past decade, we've seen some huge trades go down in order to get teams over the top, including the likes of Ben Zobras, Justin Verlander, Araldis Chapman, and Steve Pierce, just to name a few. However, none of these big acquisitions come even close to rivaling the greatest heist at the trade deadline in baseball history. In 2021, the Atlanta Braves practically threw together a World Series championship, with the majority of their playoff wins that year being decided from a plethora of players they got just two months prior. How does a team even get in this position? History has shown us that in order to even just get to the final dance, you have to not only have an exceptional group of ball players, but you also have to stay healthy. In 2021, the Atlanta Braves had a very good roster, having won the division the previous three years, following a four-year drought of being in October. But there was a problem. The Atlanta Braves suffered massive losses to key players that they would need if they wanted any chance of making a run at a championship, in which fans were starting to get impatient after not having won one since 1995. These losses included center fielder Ender Inciarte, left fielder Marcel Azuna, starting pitchers Huascar Yanoa, Tuki Toussaint, Mike Soroka, and most importantly, one of the best players in the sport, right fielder Ronald Acuna, after tearing his ACL in an awkward landing on a fly ball in Miami. Not only does it hurt losing key pieces to a rotation with Mike Soroka out for the season due to a torn Achilles and Huascar Yanoa losing a chunk of time due to smashing his hand punching the dugout, but the Braves all of a sudden were missing their entire outfield, with players Guillermo Heredia, Ahir Adrianza, and Abraham Almonte trying to fill in the gaps. Everyone knew they wouldn't make it to the promised land if this is who they were running out in October, as these guys only accounted for a total of 0.0, .0 wins above replacement. To put that in perspective, Ronald Acuna alone accounted for 3.7 while only playing 82 games to the three replacements combined 293. Luckily for the Braves, the NL East was very weak that season and even with the crippled team, there was still a solid chance they would compete in the division despite the slow start. I would also like to mention that despite these injuries, the Braves still had a very solid supporting cast, with an unbelievable infield consisting of Freddie Freeman, Dansby Swanson, Ozzy Albies, and breakout third baseman Austin Riley, who had for the most part underperformed his top prospect status while showing some flashes in 2019 and 2020, but in 2021 absolutely exploded with a 30 homer 300 average season, racking up the most war by anyone of the Braves and finishing 7th in the NL MVP voting. So it's not like the Braves had nobody now, but it would be vital that they replace the current three guys manning the outfield before they got to the playoffs if they wanted any chance at making a run. Replace would be an understatement. Alex Anthopoulos, who had been the Braves GM since 2017, did a complete overhaul of the outfield. On July 15th of that season, two weeks before the deadline, Alex felt the Braves needed someone to help them get by until then, with the Braves actually holding a losing record at the time being 45-46 and 46 while being three and a half back of the division. This help would come in the form of Jock Peterson, who before that season had signed a one-year deal with the Chicago Cubs after slugging 130 homers in the previous six years with the Dodgers. And given the nickname Jocktober, being someone always coming through in the clutch when it mattered most. As Braves fans waited to see what other additions would be made to an outfield desperately needing production, things only started to get worse, as in the two weeks between getting Jock and the trade deadline, the Braves had moved a game and a back half further with the idea of possibly selling lingering in the minds of some fans. As we all know, they didn't sell and added not one, not two, but three more outfielders on July 30th, as Alex Anthopoulos signaled that the Braves were all in. The haul was highlighted by Jorge Soler from Kansas City, Eddie Rosario from Cleveland, and Adam Duvall from Miami. Besides Duvall, who was actually on the Braves between 2018 and 2020, Everyone else who had been acquired were all on one-year deals, with none of them particularly standing out throughout the season thus far. Duvall had a 99 OPS+, plus, Soler 78, Rosario 87, and Peterson with 92, all pretty below average. So no jaw-dropping names were brought in, but when you have an entire outfield you are trying to piece together, you have to find value in cheaper and more reasonable options as guys like Acuna and Ozuna would be back for 2022. Anthopolis did this and it couldn't have worked out better while also stating how the Braves front office had a pretty good handle on the club and what the NL East was doing at the time. The Braves from that moment on were a completely different team. Not only did they catch up to the Mets and Phillies, but they ran right by them, having a 6.5 game division lead by season's end and winning 36 of 54 after the trade deadline, with only the juggernaut Giants and Dodgers having better records. 
Team chemistry can be a super weird thing in sports as every group of guys is different and it's human nature to not necessarily gel with a bunch of new guys immediately. But for the Braves, that's exactly what happened. You'd think it would be weird, but they actually all fit in pretty good, Atlanta catcher Travis Darno said. It was almost like we added another family member, even though it was someone completely new. The Braves' second half run was fun and all, but now it was October, where pieces of old and new would be put to the test. In the National League Division Series, the Braves faced off against the 95-67 and 67 Milwaukee Brewers, who many thought had a solid chance at claiming their first World Series title. That year, the Brewers had arguably the best pitching staff in the majors, highlighted by Cy Young winner Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff, and Freddie Peralta. One thing these guys all had in common was that none of them had an ERA higher than 2.81, which is just ridiculous. And even more ridiculous when you factor in Devin Williams and his wizard changeup, followed by Josh Hader, who most would argue had been the best closer in the past half decade. The Braves knew they had to score if they wanted any chance in this series, and in the first game, Corbin Burns blanked them in a route to a 2-1 victory. In Game 2, the Braves' pitching staff retaliated, not allowing a single run to win 3-0 with the series heading to Atlanta. It was here on out that Alex Anthopoulos' mid-season acquisitions would prove why he's the best GM in all of baseball. In Game 3, the Braves had Ian Anderson on the bump face and off against Freddy Peralta. Both were trading zeros with both teams struggling to find the big hit. In the fourth inning of the game, Brewers manager Craig Council made a gutsy decision. He pulled Freddy Peralta to replace him for pinch hitter Daniel Vogelback, with runners on first and second two outs in hopes of getting some runs across. As to that point, the Brew crew had been held to 14 straight scoreless innings by the Braves. This decision would become costly, as Vogelback grounded out to end the inning and now their co-ace Freddy Peralta would be out of the game with still no runs on the board for the Brewers. Adrian Hauser, a solid pitcher having a great year, would take over and immediately the Braves would take advantage. Travis Darno and Dansby Swanson both got on base to start the inning with Braves pitcher Ian Anderson, who had also been lights out that game, coming up to bat. Brian Snicker, the Braves manager, would be faced with the same question Council asked himself the inning prior. Do you take out a dealing starter or most likely take the out in hopes of the rest of the lineup figuring out? Snicker made the same call, sending midseason acquisition Jock Peterson to the plate and boy was that the right call. Down in the count 1-2, Hauser tried getting Peterson to chase a high fastball out of the zone, and he did, hitting a massive three-run homer to right to send Atlanta into a frenzy. Jocktober had begun, and that would be all the Braves needed to win the game 3-0 to secure a 2-1 series lead. In Game 4 with their backs against the wall, the Brewers' bats woke up with big hits from Rowdy Telez, Lorenzo Cain, and Omar Narvaez, but every time the Brewers scored, the Braves answered right back. The game was getting late and Craig Council brought in all-star reliever Josh Hader on in hopes of keeping the Braves off the board knowing one run for either team could very well decide the game. After striking out the first two hitters to start the inning, Freddie Freeman came up to the plate hoping to avoid being the third. And he would. Freddie was sitting first pitch slider and he got a hanger, drilling it the opposite way and over the fence to ultimately wind up sending Atlanta to a date with the Dodgers where the year previously had knocked them off despite being up 3-1. In order to win the World Series, a team must have a player or two play significantly above their normal play. As many Braves fans know, this series would end up going down as the Eddie Rosario series. Since coming over from Cleveland at the deadline, Rosario's play jumped up dramatically, posting better numbers all across the board. In the NLDS, he did his fair share of contributing, as he hit 308 throughout those four games. In the NLCS, Rosario was absolutely unstoppable, as in Game 1 he went a mere 1-4, Game 2, he went 4 for 5. Game 3, he got on base 3 times, and then Game 4. In Game 4, Rosario went 4 for 5 again, but with not one, but two homers to help slug the Braves to a 9-2 win over the Dodgers to take a commanding 3-1 lead. In Game 5, the Dodgers won convincingly as Braves fans started to bite their nails knowing how this story unfolded the season prior. But Rosario did his thing picking up another two hits. Then he called Game. In the fourth inning of a Game 6 in which many Braves fans thought they had to win, Rosario stepped up to the plate with two runners on in a 1-1 tie against Dodgers ace Walker Buehler and did what he did all series long, show up, as he blasted a three-run homer to give the Braves all they would need to finish off the Dodgers and head to the World Series for the first time since 1999. Rosario was, without a surprise, named the NLCS MVP and finished the series with a 560 average, 607 on base percentage, and an otherworldly 1.647 OPS to go along with those three homers and nine RBIs. The Atlanta Braves would face off against the Houston Astros, who were heavy favorites going into the Fall Classic after winning 95 games throughout the regular season, and easily taking care of both their White Sox and Red Sox en route to their matchup with Atlanta. Many thought Houston's reign of terror in the AL would come to an end at the beginning of the season, 
with Verlander out for the year, Springer signing with Toronto, and a plethora of young players such as Luis Garcia, Kyle Tucker, and Jordan Alvarez having not yet fully proven themselves despite flashes of potential. Game 1 would introduce the two remaining outfield additions to the world stage, as Adam Duvall and Jorge Soler to that point in the playoffs contributed for sure, but hadn't done anything to make them stand out. That changed in Game 1, as right out of the gate Jorge Soler drilled a homer to the Crawford boxes off Framber Valdez to set the tone for what would be an amazing series for him. Duvall joined in on the fun with a homer of his own to extend Atlanta's three-run lead to a more comfortable five. Soler, Duvall, and Rosario all finished Game 1 with two hits apiece, and Peterson having a knock of his own. In Game 2, the Astros dominated with almost nothing of note going on with Atlanta's offense as the legend himself, Eddie Rosario, finally went without a hit. Games 3 and 4 were more highlighted by Atlanta's pitching staff, which had been amazing throughout the postseason. Ian Anderson and Kyle Wright both held Houston bats at bay during their 5 and 4 and 2 thirds innings of work, respectively, with the nasty bullpen highlighted by Tyler Masick, AJ Minter, and Will Smith being practically perfect. Duvall continued to pick up his hits with Rosario obviously still mashing. Following a game-tying homer from Danzy Swanson in the 7th, Jorge Soler delivered a massive pinch-hit homer in Game 4 to secure a 3-1 series lead, being only one win away from it all. In Game 7, Duvall said, we're going home. As in the first inning facing Valdez again, Adam blasted a grand slam to kick off the scoring in Houston. Obviously, Atlanta felt this was a must-win game as having to go back to Houston would not be ideal. However, the Astros did what the Astros do. Big games from Carlos Correa, Yuli Gurriel, and Martin Maldonado led to an eventual Houston comeback leading to Duvall and the Braves going back to Houston just needed one more win. I wish I could make this more suspenseful, but the Braves straight up saved their best game of the postseason for when it mattered most. Just like he did in the first game of the series, Jorge Soler hit an absolute moonshot to left field in Houston, but this time completely out of the stadium to give Atlanta a three-run lead they would never look back on. Homers from Braves staples Freddie Freeman and Dansby Swanson all but sealed their win with the pitching staff highlighted by a six shutout from Max Freed blanking Houston, giving Atlanta their first World Series win since 1995, with Jorge Soler, who hit 300 with three homers, being named MVP of the Fall Classic. Over the previous decade, most World Series winners have been teams that have been one of the highest seeds with the Braves being the only three seed to win, and only the Nationals in 2019 and the Giants in 2014 winning as wildcard teams. None of these teams were quite as banged up as Atlanta though, which just makes this World Series completely remarkable. If Alex Anthopoulos didn't go out and get each and every one of the four acquisitions he made, they may not have made the playoffs and definitely wouldn't have won the World Series. Jock Peterson, Adam Duvall, Eddie Rosario, and Jorge Soler will all go down in Braves history forever, despite most fans probably not even knowing who they were at the start of the season. After the season, the Braves knew they couldn't keep all of these postseason heroes, with Acuna and Ozuna scheduled to return for 2022. Jock Peterson signed with the Giants and Soler with the Marlins. Duvall would be around for another year before signing with the Red Sox before the 2023 season. Eddie Rosario remains the only deadline acquisition from 2021 to remain with Atlanta and has been solid but nothing close to what he did in that playoffs. A few Atlanta staples would also be gone soon following the World Series. Despite wanting to stay in Atlanta, Freddie Freeman would sign with the Dodgers which would break the hearts of many despite just winning a ring. Swanson left a year later signing with the Cubs. Two years later, the Braves had an arguably better roster despite falling short against the Phillies in back-to-back -back division series. Perhaps some team just play better when they're not supposed to come out on top. Who do you guys think was the Braves' biggest acquisition in 2021? Let me know in the comments, and if you guys enjoyed this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.